Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2015 International CES. You're going to want to come right over here for an interview with Nicole Gallucci, the author of Adversperience, part of Gary's book club. Welcome to CES, Nicole. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great, yeah, great so to be here. We're talking about this, this book that you wrote, but before we, we get into that, I wanted to just have you take a moment to give us just a, a quick professional autobiography. You've got a wealth of experience in marketing, product marketing, and so forth, media planning, marketing, etc. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background and, more importantly, why you wrote the book. Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. It's awesome. This is totally adverse experience on steroids, if I can say that. Uh, so I started off in brand marketing, fresh out of university with Nestle, and then went on to do a joint venture for Nestle and Coke. And after I left that, I uh, started Boom Marketing with uh, some other founders. And today, that's exactly what I still do. And you know, we wrote the book, or I wrote the book, uh, as a result of talking to so many of our clients. You know, we uh, are an agency based out of Toronto, but we cover uh, Canada very thoroughly and feed into the U.S. And truthfully, all of our clients were saying the same thing. And it's literally that there's just so much distraction and disruption going on, and how can they reach their target market? And it didn't matter what client or what brand. And so everybody was looking for a roadmap. So literally, I took a step back and said, okay, how can I make this a little bit easier for everyone? Obviously, the world's changing. So we can't pretend to be gurus of change, but we can pretend, or in fact, not even pretend, but actually get ahead of the curve and figure out, okay, what is it gonna take to manage the change and make sure that we understand what it's gonna take to resonate with consumers, hence adverse experience. Yeah, because you reference a lot of the you know, innovation and disruption out there, which is clearly what the 350 the million photographs are downloaded to Facebook every day. Wow. So are you kidding me? There's a lot going on out there. Well, and so you'll notice that Nicole's book is green, and it's green for a reason. Yes. And that is, uh, and you also see a little skyline on the front of the book, and that is the Emerald City, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it totally is. And uh, the book uh, parallels a lot of uh, experiential and adversarial marketing concepts uh, and uses the analogy with the Wizard of Oz and this path that consumers take down the yellow brick road uh, and so forth. And so why, why the tie-in with, with Wizard of Oz? Why the Emerald City? Why, why the, the Emerald Oz? City? What, 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 what inspired you to use that? It, it works really well, by the way, because it makes for a very uh, engaging read and it, it instantly brings a lot of these, what in a textbook context, Concept, totally, you know, totally. context may be kind of dry, but it really livens it up because when I'm reading about the Tin Man and the Scarecrow <laughs> and some of their ideas and Dorothy, yeah. uh, it really ties it into things that I actually think and feel when I'm shopping around for, for brands. Yeah, totally fair. My, I was going to wear red glitter shoes, but my kids said that was going to be over the top, so I wasn't allowed. But uh, the, the tie into The Wizard of Oz and fairness is because we are in the marketing industry. And so we need to have a little bit of fun. At the end of the day, we're selling brands, but we're, we're, it's about life. And so life needs to, while there are certainly serious elements, we need to engage and provide consumers a reason to tell a story about our brands. So in that vein, The Wizard of Oz provided a perfect analogy and metaphor for many of the challenges that we're facing. You know, The Wizard of Oz starts off with a cyclone, which is very analogous to the insanity of our world and all the clutter of information, et cetera, and Dorothy goes off into the cyclone and has to figure things out. And in the process, she befriends some people similar to the way we befriend, whether we know them or not, through social technology. So that allows us to then carve our own path. So the Yellow Brick Road provides a roadmap. And of course, in the marketing world, our roadmap is towards share and volume and dollars at the end of the day that all feed to our P&L. So hence the Emerald City analogy is quite appropriate. And it goes without saying that there's wizardry and magical fairy dust in all that we do, because you literally have to sit back and figure it out and think about what is going to make the consumer say, oh my god, I have to engage with that brand and have that aha moment. So there's magic in everything. And so that element of surprise and delight was very apropos. So Adversperience allows you to, as you're reading the book, at least feel lighthearted and engaged, because you have to bring the pages to life. So short of doing that digitally, it allows you to do that with paper. And in fairness, it is meant to be a bit of a primer for 
kids in the university system and college system, and in fact, it's being used uh, in Canada in exactly that way in one of our colleges that focuses on experiential marketing. Yeah, so. yeah and, it, and, and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because you really invented the term, but adversperience is really the confluence of advertising and experiential marketing. Yes, it is. And uh, a couple of interesting things, just to come back to Wizard of Oz for a second. I thought it was interesting in the book that you say that like the characters in The Wizard of Oz, everybody had a different notion or idea about who Oz was. So do marketers have different notions and idea about who, who's the consumer, who's the customer, right? Absolutely. And we actually talk about that because the consumer may, is, is ideally the person who's physically using the product. But so often we're actually talking to the shopper and you know a, a mom is a perfect example. She brings home all the groceries every day, but there's everybody in the house that is consuming that product. You know, so, and I use the example in the book, Razors, a, a, a partner often says Buyers to their spouse. and shoppers. Yeah, that it's totally different. You know, can you, you, you potentially say to your partner or your wife, can you please go and buy me razors? And she may or may not know what you use and you may or may not like what comes home. So uh, that true, it, that's so much the case and hence the reason that nobody really knew who Oz was. So that, that was hence the reason for that analogy. Yeah, and it, and it really does work eloquently, eloquently in the book. And further, the, the yellow brick road as this path to purchase, ostensibly, yep. uh, works really well because clearly we know what happens to Dorothy and her friends. They have a lot of unexpected adventures and circumstances that happen to them, but so do consumers, too. There's a lot of distraction out there and experiential marketing. I mean, we want, to, we want that to be a pleasant disruption uh, and something because they're they're clearly have an agenda and they're engaging with different bits But we want to encourage them to engage with us. We have to make that uh, and that's what really Experiential marketing is about is in making that enticing fun emotional uh, and that human connection, right? Absolutely, and I think in the book what we've done is a, is a couple of different things. So the yellow brick road is intended to be literally a road map. So it allows you to evaluate your brand and actually do a brand review and business plan and then find the right path really going from briefing all the way to concept development so you that ensure that you turn a head, stir a heart, build a brand and make a sale on behalf of your consumer so you get that aha moment. All of that said, in addition to that, in the book, we speak a lot about the adversarial continuum. And I think that is a fundamental piece as we look at, I mean, here at CES, you look at all the technology around you. You know, everyone will start planning for CES as, literally on Saturday and Sunday. You know, the conference ends on Friday, and so the momentum will begin for the next year. And so the, part of the point of the continuum is actually the impact on the human heart rate. And we're That's actually right, yeah. talking to a couple of universities about how can we actually study how we impact consumers. So if you use this as an analogy, there's a build up to CES. So we start to get engaged and in fairness, our heart rate continues to stay relatively even and then we get closer and closer and we're booking our flights and we're buying our tickets and now we start to elevate because physiologically there's a degree of excitement or we wouldn't be here. And then you're actually here and of course you're excited. The music's pounding, you're seeing technology that you've never seen, you know, Nick Cannon's up here on the stage yesterday and he's walking around and he's all excited. And so there's lots going on. So you're fully engaged. So it goes without saying that there's a physiological impact on you. So of course, that's when the continuum is at its highest point, as is your heart rate. And then as, obviously, as we go off into the weekend and we're sharing and we're tweeting, et cetera, the momentum builds, but obviously your heart rate begins to settle as you go back into normal life. But the whole point of creating an amazing adverse experience is that there have been stories that you have now been intertwined in that are brand stories as well. And those two cannot be taken apart. They're forever part of your being and your body. You can't untaste, untouch, unsmell. You can't unexperience. So if brands do it correctly, it remains part of your physiology and it stays with you for life. And that's the intent. And uh, done properly, you then create brand ambassadors and brand loyalists. And so goes your brand share and volume. Yeah, yeah the people that are going to convey their experience and share their story, which is, in a way, the marketer's story, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So they're going to be able to share that. And then hopefully that person would then be uh, obliged to go and experience firsthand uh, some of those uh, concepts or whatnot. Well, you know, Nick Woodman spoke last night at the Leadership and Technology uh, dinner. And he was going on, you know, when he started 
GoPro. He was literally starting it as an amazing surfer dude who wanted a better way to film exactly how they were surfing and the momentum of the waves and as you're riding the wave, etc. I'm not even going to pretend to know <laughs> how to surf. Tried it, not that great. Um, but that was how GoPro started, very honorably in that method. And now people are using it because everybody wants to tell a story. So brands have the opportunity to help us engage and enjoy our lives and tell stories. And at the end of the day, though technology is all around us, it serves us. We don't live for it. It lives for us and allows us a platform to go and share with all of our friends and colleagues and maybe boast or not, whatever the case sure. may be. So sure. I think that's, that was what he has discovered with GoPro, but I think that's so true for many of us. So really it's the onus is on brands if they want to engage with consumers to provide consumers with that opportunity to elevate their own lives and their own experiences. Fair point. And by the way, uh, I almost wore a blue shirt and khakis uh, for this interview, but I was afraid that, that you wouldn't talk to me because uh, it's, 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 a, yeah, it's an inside joke that you're going to have to read the book to, to find out you know why that's uh, totally. so uh, <laughs> abrasive to Nicole. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's shift gears for a moment and talk. We we've we've underscored the importance of uh, uh, experiential marketing and an adversarial uh, experience. But how do we how do we start to make a plan with this? In the book, you talk about shift happens and and some of these these other dynamics that can take hold. So how do we start to craft as marketers this uh, adversarial uh, yeah, campaign? Totally fair. Totally fair. And I think, first of all, you got to know your brand. And you have to know the reason that it exists and what exactly is that aha moment that it provides for consumers. And then how can you take that aha moment and bring it to life in a way that is relevant and resonates? You know, uh, we have a very good example. I'm, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with banking machines. Uh, so TD in Canada launched, as opposed to a banking machine, they launched a thanking machine. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So you would go up to the machine and you'd put in your card and you would actually think that you were going to be doing banking, but of course at TD Bank or at any bank, they know everything about us. So they know all our transactions, they know our patterns, and in fact in, in the age of more human connection, they actually know your family, etc. So this machine actually awarded consumers with some things that they could see that were passions in their lives. So someone would go up and they'd get tick season's tickets and become season's ticket holders to their favorite sport. Uh, one woman was sent home to join her daughter in another country. So things like that that now elevate, obviously there's an intrinsic value for the brand there. They're actually communicating and operating in a system that is very expected by the consumer. At the same time, they've provided incremental engagement. So that's where you need to understand, you know, what are people doing? What is their mindset when they're going up to your product? So in this case, they could understand the mindset of that consumer as they're putting their card in the machine. They're expecting to take money out and they're calculating what is the impact on my life of the transaction that I'm making. So they took that transaction one step further. So needless to say, that spread over social media. Many people here, you know, WestJet's a Canadian airline, but I'm sure they've seen the WestJet Santa story. If not, you should Google it. It's awesome. Um, but things like that where we're actually taking what we're already doing for consumers but really getting to the point of what is going through their minds at the time of engagement with our brand and how can we elevate that experience and now take it one step further so that they are sharing the story. They're not just sharing, uh, you know, I got on the plane and I went here or I went to the bank machine. They're actually saying, oh my God, this is how it went one step further. Sure, and is this what, and you tell me, but is this what you mean and can kind of simplify it in the book with this turn ahead Stir a, heart, stir a heart, build, build a, a brand, brand, make a sale. Yeah, good, good. That's awesome. That's our anthem. We have two litmus tests, and that's one. And then the adverse experiential continuum is the other one. And really, the turn ahead, stir a heart, build a brand came from the fact that I was on client side. And uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I hated when agencies came in, and it was like, ah. Uh, how are we going to get to the other side of this? And I hated when I was a consumer walking down the street and someone would break my stride because I was on a mission. I had places to go and things to do. Mm -hmm. So what if, if I was going to be engaged, it needed to be awesome. And so I wanted consumers and clients who are being impacted by the work that we were doing to go, actually, I want to go over there. I want to see what that lineup's about, and then I'll decide if I'm going to get in line. Mm -hmm. And we'll have consumers stand in line for what feels like days and hours but it's because the engagement's worth it. And so they're in and around it. And so now we've actually tar started to figure out, okay, what are we gonna do so that they're not in line? Or while they're in line, there's incremental experiences happening because we've actually 
created something that is so pleasurable, enjoyable that they actually want to wait, and it's worth the wait. True. And I think that's what brands have to think about. Yeah. They want consumers to want to wait and to want to touch them. We shouldn't make them wait. But if consumers are standing in line to wait, your experience better be awesome. And if it is, that's, that elevates it tenfold. And how ironic that retailers, I think they're starting to get it, but by large, they, they don't seem to get it. Because in the book, you articulate a specific example of a very creative, creative adversarial campaign that was, in fact, not endorsed by the retailer. Yeah. And you, in the book, you say you kind of had to dumb it down. And it was, in a way, it was devastating because you've created this, this tremendous experience for the brand, but the channel is not really playing ball. So is that starting to change a bit? Because we hear about pop-up stores, brands taking matters into their own hands. We're going to do this the right way. We're going to create this uh, adversarial uh, store to, to we, we think about a lot of examples here, but but go on, yeah, tell us, are, are the channels starting to get this? We hear about, you know, these sampling and uh, yeah. and retailtainment, like with Walmart, I think you point to and give them a lot of credit. But tell us, are things Walmart starting to really shift? Walmart really got things started many, many years ago. They were one of the pioneers in allowing us to come in and sample and actually take it one step further, in fairness to them. A lot of grocery stores and drug stores right across North America do this as well. I think the issue is, is because so many people were coming in and saying, oh, well, we'd like to heighten that experience. You know, you can't, we were making them nervous because now we want to do a takeover of their environments in order to really engage and get that exponential impact. So I think that's where they started to say, okay, well, there's guidelines. It's this table and now put a wrap on it, et cetera. The unfortunate part is that that's now making it very generic. So we have to allow for that heightened opportunity. And I think retailers are going to come around. And unfortunately, because in some cases, retailers haven't come around either a retail environment. And you, you do look at some retailers that are doing it well, like Apple, et cetera. And you look at retailers where they're providing, you know, Apple owns its own brand and its own products. So it, for all intents and purposes, it is a bit of a parallel to a pop-up store more so than a Walmart or a grocery store that on any given aisle, there's thousands of SKUs. You know, a small grocer has 120,000 SKUs in their store. Wow. So you potentially have a lot of brands coming in there and say you can't have 120,000 brands doing 120,000 different things. So I think that's why they put some of the criteria in place. So I get that. That said, I think there has to be levels of opportunity for us to heighten it. The pop-up stores are a perfect example where brands have said, okay, well, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm, I'm certainly not going to diminish my relationship with my retailer. What I am going to do is, in, in light of the fact that I have this pop-up store opportunity, I'm going to blow out the pop-up store, and I'm going to give them all the touch points that are critical to me, but I'm going to drive them back to the retailer to make the purchase so that I've completed the cycle and made, ensured all my relationships are still solid and intact. Yeah, fair enough. And we see sampling, you know, with bourbon chicken yeah. and so forth. And that works and that moves product. It as moves you say product the book, at the time. The issue is, is that, is it a branded bur bourbon chicken? Did you get that part? And I think yeah. that's the part where we struggle. You know, everything needs to have that branded piece. Otherwise, they're going in to buy the bourbon chicken. They're going in right. to buy your brand yeah. and they need to buy your brand. Yeah. And you talk about the Costco grazers and so forth. And it's so sampling, it, it's got to be more than gut fill is uh, I think the term that you use in the book. But yeah, so absolutely. is adversarial marketing, is that something that is reserved for premier brands or is this something that really anybody can uh, a, a tactic and a strategy that any brand can really use to Oh my God, effect? any brand can do this. You know, it's not rocket science. All this really says is that, you know, if you looked back into the 1980s and 1990s when advertising was truly the mecca and that was your opportunity. You showed a brand one day and the next day your sales resonated. Truth is we can't do that. It doesn't have the same impact anymore because there's over 5,000 messages that we're inundated with on any given day. So if it was a perfect world, we would have all these one-to-one -one conversations about our brands. That would be awesome. And because we couldn't do that, that's what gave rise to advertising. Now those one-to-one -one conversations are happening by our consumers. So if we're going to give our consumers the opportunity to tell those stories, let's elevate what they're saying and actually help them tell the story. And that's what Adverse Experience is about. It's about helping them craft a story that was in that is part of our brand story. So any brand can do this. You have to figure out what your story is and then create that experience for your consumer so they go off and tell it to their friends and their friends and so on and so on. It, it makes complete sense. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, the book is Adversperience, the author, Nicole Gallucci. And 
it's a great read. Come join us in the Emerald City. Yeah, uh, we'd be delighted to have you. It's, it's a great read. It's a fun read. And uh, enjoy the rest of your CES uh, adverse experience because there's certainly a lot of that uh, uh, here oh today. God. This is the Mecca. It, it is. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody.